Hi, this is a video overviewing Greek verbs. There are so many uh, tools today that are available for the student. It used to be you had to memorize all these forms. There was hardly any other way to do it. Uh, you could buy, of course, they did have paper interlinears and paper analyticals and things like that. But I think it's only been recently when there's been this pedagogical shift to where, you know, most people forget these forms anyway. The old purist model was grossly ineffective. Maybe 5% maybe of those who studied Greek remembered the forms even by the end of the summer after their first year. And so it's much more practical and helpful and useful and actually helpful to knowledge um, to learn what the categories are and then rely on the tools to tell you what a particular form is. And so in that, in that vein of thinking, this is a video overviewing the various tenses of Greek verbs. Okay, so there is this site, it's uh, biblehub.com backslash interlinear. I just always type in interlinear.com because that's easy to remember and it redirects. Uh, but basically what you're going to find there is an interlinear, which means between the lines you have the Greek and then between the lines you have information about the Greek and it tells you all the answers. I've never known it to be wrong yet, although I've not read it all, but um, this seems to be a very accurate interlinear. So for example, here's the way the basic layout is. So you're gonna have the Strong's number at the top. What is the, the Strong's number? Well, the Strong's number, there's this guy named James Strong, who I think in the 1800s, of course, they didn't have television, so he had nothing to do with himself. So he basically went through both the Old and New Testaments, and in the New Testament, he went word for word of the Greek New Testament, and every time he came on a new word, he put it in alphabetical order with its definition, and so on. And so basically, he has a list of all the words used in Greek words used in the New Te Greek New Testament, and he's numbered them. So, for example, uh, the word erkamai, uh, which means to come or to go, it's kind of weird to us English speakers that a word would mean both to come and to go, but that, that's the way it is is the 2064th Greek word in alphabetical order in the New Testament. And so the number, so here's the Greek text. The Greek text is in the middle. And between the lines above and below, you have this information. And the first line tells you what the word is. And so 2064 tells you this is the, this tells you what the word is. And if you click on it in interlinearbible.org, it's gonna take you to uh, a page that tells you that the word you're looking at, even though it doesn't look like Urkami, I mean, look at it. It looks like Aelthin. Well, that's what it is. It's actually, I'm sorry, it shouldn't be a rough breathing mark. It's Aelthin, not Hailthin. Um, so that's wrong there. So Aelthin here doesn't look like Urkami because sometimes words don't look like their dictionary form. Take the word went in English. Um, if, if you have, let's say you have somebody who's learning English and you tell them that went is the past tense of go. I go now, I went yesterday. And they look at you like, what are you crazy? Who invented this language? Well, we don't, we don't notice it if you're a native English speaker because you know it. But in Greek, um, you have the same thing. So aelthin is the aorist or the past tense of erkamai. Um, who knew? And, and you, used to have to, you used to have to memorize all that stuff. We don't have to memorize it anymore. All we have to do is click on the Strong's number and ding, it'll tell us. This word is Urkami. Yay, what a wonderful world we live in. And of course, um, the second line gives you what's called the transliteration. The transliteration is taking the Greek letters and putting it into English letters. So eta is a long A, uh, a long a E with a, with a, that means long mark over it. There's the L for the lambda, TH for the theta, epsilon, or E for the epsilon, and N for the movable nu, it's called. But anyway, so elthen, and there's elthen. So that's the transliteration. So the Strong's number tells you what the word is. There's the transliteration. Then the third line is the actual Greek text. And then we have the translation, came, uh, is the past tense uh, of Urkami, come or go. Uh, so it gives you a rough translation underneath. And then on the bottom is the code. The code, aye, the code, it's more like a code, matey. Uh, the code there is, G it's brilliant. You don't have to memorize stuff anymore. I mean, go ahead and memorize it by all means. I'm not against memorizing it. I like memorizing it. I have all kinds of gimmicks for memorizing it. 
but you don't have to memorize it anymore. You can get right into the Greek after this, after this video. You can get right into the verbs of the New Testament, analyzing tenses. After the sermon, you can go and look it up um, because the code uh, tells you what the words are. So V stands for verb because this is a verb. A verb is either a being or a doing, you know, um, word, you know, action word. Uh, I came, I go, you're doing stuff, right? Um, so it's a verb. Um, the first letter tells you the tense. And that's what this video is about. This video is about the Greek tenses, which make some people tense, but hopefully this video will be okay. Um, in English, we, we think of present tense, past tense, future tense, as we're going to see tense in Greek is more about the kind of action than the timing. In fact, there are some scholars like Stanley Porter who would say it's not about the timing at all. I'm not prepared to, uh, to say that, um, although I'm not an expert like Porter is, but um, I think for practical reasons, we can certainly say that it's about timing in part, even if it's not in, uh, primarily about timing. Um, I don't like the fact that linear linear uh, puts the mood second, but it does, so we're stuck with it because I didn't come up with a free resource with an interlinear for everything. So that I stands for indicative. Uh, that basically means statements or simple questions. Um, so the I is not real meaningful to you right now. Uh, the third uh, letter is the voice, uh, active, middle, or passive. I wish that they put deponent in there, which is another thing about voice, that I won't talk about that in this video. I talk about in another video, I'm pretty sure. Active means the subject does the verb. Passive means the subject is done by the verb. Middle means that the subject is doing the verb, but in such a way that the, the subject is being acted upon as well, or it's bouncing back in some way on the, the subject. Just ignore that. There's another video um, on, on voice. Uh, person and number. Uh, third person means he, she, it, or they. Singular means uh, he, she, or it, not they. Third person plural would be that the subject is a they. Um, so third singular means that the subject is a he, a she, or an it. Okay, so the code. So we're, we're interested in that first letter. Um, v, uh, here's the things I just said. So V stands for verb. AIA means aorist, which is the tense, indicative, which is the mood, and active, which is the voice. And this video is about this first letter. Okay, and 3S means third singular, things I said that would have been better if I'd have just gone to this slide, wouldn't it? Okay, so the tense code. Um, the tense is that first letter. So uh, I've already told you this is aorist. You don't know what an aorist is yet. Aorist, let's just call it the past tense, the simple past tense. So here's an example. Uh, 26 tells you, uh, if you click on the 26, the Strong's number, it's gonna take you to a word Agapao. Now, agapao doesn't look like agape sen. Um, who knew? Uh, but that's why we have this free interlinear.com. You don't have to know what that form is. You can click on this, and it'll tell you what word it is, and this will tell you what form it is. Yay, what a wonderful world we live in. It's the internet. I invented it. Okay, so uh, this is the transliteration. Uh, agape sen, the, the middle has the Greek then a rough translation, loved, and then the code at the bottom. This is great, right? So, uh, again, the first letter after the V is the tense. So, what are the Greek tenses? And now, drum roll, please. Uh, these are the tenses in this video. So, P stands for present tense, which uh, I am loosing, or I loose. I stands for a past tense called the imperfect tense. I was loosing. So it's kind of like the, the same continuous flavor of the present, but in the past. Uh, there is a future tense, will loose. There is an aorist tense, which is a simple past tense, I loosed. Um, there's a tense called the perfect tense, uh, he has loosed. Uh, it, it has the sense of it happened and, and, and that loosing state remained. And then there's also a pluperfect which is the past perfect, had loosed. Okay, so those are the tenses and the code in interlinearbible.org uh, for the tenses. So the primary connotation, if it's not time, what is it? What's, what is the primary connotation of tense if it's not time? Well, it is the kind of action, or for those of you who like German words, uh, the Aktionsart, 
the Aktian's art, the kind of action. Yes, throw that around at lunch for your friends. So basically, there are three kinds of action that a Greek verb can have. There is the simple kind of action, which is undefined. It just says it happened. It doesn't say, it, it literally means unmarked, uh, one of the versions of this. So if, if, the, if the kind of action is unmarked, I'm not telling you how it happened. I'm just saying it happened. And so that's the bleh, uh, plain kind of simple kind of action, undefined action. Then there are some forms that tend to have a more continuous or ongoing flavor. Um, it, he is loosing. So that in, in the present tense, the difference between these two would be he is loosing, which has a more continuous flavor, flavor or he looses. He looses is a simple uh, kind of undefined version of that. And then there's a completed or perfective kind of action in Greek. That means it's done and it stayed done. Uh, I've been married for 20 years. You know, I got married and I'm still married. It's done. It was done back then and it's still done. Okay, so uh, there we have uh, the kinds, those are the three kinds of actions that will, the tenses will, uh, that in Greek will interact with these kinds of actions. So when you bring in time, here's a little chart. Uh, I don't know if this is helpful. If it's not helpful, just ignore it. So you have present time, future time, past time, and then you have these three different kinds of action. And so when we play out the tenses in, uh, in Greek uh, with, with the kind of action, it ends up like this. So the present tense, the, I have it in bold here, because the present tense primarily connotes present time continuous action. I am loosing. So you could translate the basic present either I am loosing or I loose. Preferred is the I am loosing version uh, because it is present continuous. Now the, the present tense can also mean uh, present simple, I loose. You know, roses are red, violets are blue, you know, um, uh, skunks stink. Okay, that's a, that's a kind of a simple present statement, right? Um, as opposed to that skunk is stinking. Uh, that would be continuous flavor. Both of the present tense does both of them, but the primary connotation of the present tense is continuous action. Okay, the future tense, the primary, I have it in bold, the primary connotation of the future tense is future simple action. He will come. I will do it. Now, you could say I will be doing it. Um, that's a continuous future continuous, but that is not the primary. When you talk about the future, usually in Greek, it, it's speaking simply and undefinedly of the future. Uh, the Lord will return from heaven with a shout. Uh, it's just going to happen. Not the Lord will be returning on Tuesdays. That would be a, you could, you could use the future tense to do that, but usually the future tense simply is saying simple future. It will happen. You will not kill. Okay. So, uh, in the past tense, now here's where this becomes useful. You know, you say, well, why am I distinguishing this out if the present and future tense do both of them, um, aside from the fact that they have a kind of a primary kind of action? Well, because here's where it gets interesting in the past tense. There are two different past tenses here uh, that, that in terms of simple and continuous. If you simply want to say it happened, then you use the what's called the aorist tense. He died. Jesus wept doesn't say how long he was weeping. Jesus was weeping for 20 minutes. Now, if you wanted to say that, you would use another tense, the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense in Greek is past continuous act action. See how you can, you can talk about the same event using two different tenses and focus on two different aspects. So if you say Jesus wept, you're just saying, Bleh, he did it. Um, you, by the way, this isn't necessarily instantaneous. There were some holiness preachers in the past who knew enough Greek to be dangerous. And they argued that uh, the aorist tense of 1 Thessalonians 5.23 suggests that sanctification is an instantaneous event. Well, sanctification may be an instantaneous event, but the Greek doesn't prove it because the aorist simply means unmarked. It simply says, Bleh, let, uh, it happened uh, in the past or it happens. Um, so there's a verse in Galatians or somewhere, no, maybe it's in Acts. It says, uh, Israel sojourned, for 400 some years in Egypt. Well, obviously that's not an instantaneous event, but it's aorist because it's blah, it's just saying it happened. It's not telling you how long it happened. I mean, they could have used an imperfect. They could have said Israel was sojourning uh, in Egypt for 400 years, 
And you could have talked about the same event with a continuous kind of way of talking about it. So you can say Jesus wept and just say he did it in an undefined way. But you could also say Jesus wept for two hours. Or I'm sorry, Jesus was weeping for two hours. That continuous way of talking about the past tense is the, we use the imperfect tense to do that. So the difference between the aorist and the imperfect tenses in Greek is the aorist is the simple past, it happened, and then the imperfect is it was happening, more continuous flavor. Now the perfect tense uh, has to do with completed action. Um, and there are actually three different perfect tenses uh, in Greek, as we'll see at the very end of this video. So there's the present perfect, I have been married 20 years, so that's, that's uh, it happened and it, remain, it remains the case. There is a future uh, perfect that is very rare in the New Testament. In fact, some would say it doesn't exist. But uh, in Matthew um, 16, I think it is, Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, will have been bound. So that suggests that at some point in the future, it will be bound and then it will remain, remain bound until some other point in the future. It will have been bound. Um, and of course, Jesus bound it when he rose from the dead. When he died and rose from the dead, he bound in heaven what will be bound on earth. Uh, so, that, so it happened, it's completed, and then at any point, including now, when we bind something in the church, it will have been bound in heaven at the time that Jesus died and rose from the dead. At least that's one way of talking about it. So that's called a future tense. Uh, have been bound for the perfect will have been bound for the future perfect, and then past perfect had been bound. Uh, so let's say that somebody is married for five years, and uh, so, sorry for the example, let's say they get divorced after five years. You could say uh, they had been married five years when they got divorced. Um, so it happened, it was completed action, it continued, but then it ended at some point in the past. Or at least I'm talking about it from a perspective of, of, of uh, I mean, you could talk about it, um, uh, you could talk about something that has continued. So again, this is about how we're talking about stuff. So I could talk about my marriage and I could say, we had been married five years when we went on a cruise. Now that's a past perfect. We had been married, it happened, and then we were married five years and then we went on a cruise. Um, and I could still use the past perfect even though I'm still married. We had been married five years when we went on a cruise. So you see how the perfect tense works? Has has been married, speaking of it in terms of its continuation into the present. Uh, you will have been married five years when you go on a cruise. Let's say you're not married now, but you will have been married five years when you get your five-year anniversary. Um, so you see how it's, it's about how you talk about it, completed and continuing. And you can do that either in the present or in the future or in the past. So those are the perfect uh, tenses. Okay, so it's a brave new world, not like English, is it? So the present tense. The present tense tends to be continuous action in the present time. So uh, let's, let's put a word up here. So uh, pleirusta, um, it is a verb, it's present because the first letter is a P. And I gave you the code a few slides ago. Uh, it's imperative, uh, that's what the M stands for, but don't worry about that, that'll be another video. Then P is passive here, uh, be filled, and then it's second person uh, plural. Uh, so if you clicked on that, it means to fill. Uh, I should have translated it something like be being filled. Uh, this is from, I think, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a continuous action because of the present tense. It means you should be in, a, in an ongoing state of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's Tuesday. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? It's Wednesday. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be in a state of filledness with the Holy Spirit, not just once, but continuously. May you be filled, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the present tense primarily means continuous action. The sense is that a person not just be full of the Spirit once, uh, but as an ongoing, continuous kind of experience. Of course, we don't want to overdo this sort of things. They're just talking, right? They're not doing this, this overload, uh, but, but, but there is truth to what we're saying here. These are the the primary connotations. The future tense, Undef primarily undefined action in future time. So um, this tells you the word, click on it, and it'll tell you that the word is baptizo. You don't have to memorize it because it tells you. Um, so baptizo means to baptize. 
There's a transliteration. There's the Greek. Will baptize. Again, what does the code tell me? It's a verb. It's future is the tense. It's indicative. It's active. Third person singular. He will baptize. Um, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, the passive would be he will be baptized. Uh, I think that's what it says, although it's under my, my menu strip, so I can't see. But I think it's saying that the passive would be he will be baptized. Future tense, okay? Um, Eros tense. This is the simple past tense. Undefined action in past time. Now, again, there are, there are, we're going to find out, if you, if you continue on your Greek uh, journey, you're going to find out that um, the Eros isn't always in past time. But because we're, we're starting to learn the tenses, let's go ahead and say it's undefined action, possibly in past time. In the indicative, it's going to tend to be in past time. So here's an example. So the code tells me that this is a verb and that it's in the aorist tense, indicative, active, third singular. So if you click on that, it's going to tell you the word is agapao, to love. You don't have to memorize it because it tells you. Uh, here's the transliteration. Um, and this is probably from John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Uh, uh, now, it doesn't tell you how God loved. It doesn't tell you how long God loved. Maybe he's, I mean, like we, know, we know from our theology that he continues to love us. But it simply says he loved. It doesn't, I mean, for, just on the basis of the grammar, he could have stopped loving you after uh, God so loved the world, he created the world. And then he got sick of it and he stopped. I mean, it doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you what happened. It just say, bleh, he loved the world. Okay? Um, so basic Eris translations. Basic Eris translations. So what we've done so far, I didn't give you nuances of the present tense, uh, but there are some nuances that these things can have. Um, um, well, okay. Uh, that's a later video, a later slide. Um, Basic translations, just to start off with, Jesus wept, bleh, it happened. He endured them 40 years, bleh, he endured them. Notice that this isn't instantaneous. So the heiress doesn't mean instantaneous. Passive, Jesus was, he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, they were received. Um, again, you can see how uh, the active, the subject does the verb. Uh, the passive, the subject is done by the verb. Okay, I'd ask for questions, but you're not there. Okay, nuances of the present tense. Now we're getting into some nuances. Um, so the most basic nuance of the present tense is something that's going on right now. Ken is making a video. Um, uh, Ken is teaching. That's the descriptive present. But there are, and I, I've heard people say, well, Romans 7 has to be about Paul's current experience because it's present tense. Eh. Present tense, uh, remember, the primary connotation of the present tense is continuous action, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean always present time even. So there's a historical present where you talk about the past tense. Uh, you talk about past time using vivid present language. So you, um, I associate this with Canadians. Sorry. Uh, I'm walking down the street, eh? And this guy comes up to me. Um, so, uh, and this, you know, some of the gospels use this. So Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, you know, and he sees two men, you know, I don't, I don't remember whether that particular passage is, is present, but it could be. That's a historical present. We're talking about the past very vividly uh, using present tense language. There's also nomic, the nomic present, uh, which gives a general truth. Roses are red, violets are blue. Uh, the present tense would be used there because you're giving, uh, the law is spiritual. Um, that's a nomic truth. I am carnal. I don't think Paul actually is describing himself in the present time there. I think he's talking about, although he could be in the sense that carnal means fleshly, and I am fleshly, right? Um, whether I'm acting fleshly or not, I'm made of flesh. So he could be talking descriptively there, but I think he's speaking nomically. Um, the law is spiritual, I am fleshly. Okay, a nomic, uh, the nomic. And when, when the present tense is nomic, it tends to be uh, undefined rather than continuous. It, when it's descriptive, it tends to be continuous. When it's nomic, just giving a general truth, it's going to tend to be just simple statement. Iterative means something that's um, uh, done repeatedly. So I am taking a class on Tuesday nights. Uh, that's something that's repeated. I am taking, but it's present tense, right? Um, 
tendential. Sometimes you can hear, I mean, you kind of trust the force, Luke, listen to the force. Sometimes you can hear other connotations leap out. You don't want to force them into, um, the, but you can hear like, for example, there are places where try to um, can jump out of the translation, believe it or not. Uh, and there are others, but this gives you a sense of some of the, so, so, so um, we're not in Kansas anymore. Greek tenses can do, a, so again, this is my pet peeve, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be harsh here, but a lot of times what preachers say from the pulpit about Greek, you can tell they know just enough to get it wrong. And they do this a lot with tenses. Um, like the present, the present tense doesn't always mean present time. There are lots of nuances, both in English and in Greek, uh, that the present tense can have. And so here's just a small sampling. Uh, well, it's a large sampling of what the present tense can do. Nuances of the future tense. Well, there's the simple future that simply says, but it's going to happen. It will end. This will end. Uh, this suffering will end. But it will happen. Simple future. Uh, you do have the imperatival future. You will pick up your clothes. Uh, where um, you're stating a future tense indicative, but you're really making a command. You will not steal. You will not kill. You will not commit adultery. Those are future tenses generally. So that's the imperatival future, the command future. Okay, those are the only two I decided to tell you about because they're the most important. Nuances of the aorist. Well, there's the simple aorist, the undefined, Jesus wept. But unfortunately, there are other possibilities. There is, um, um, there is a gnomic aorist where you say a general truth using the past tense. I'm trying to think of an example of this. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you can translate these differently. Um, uh, this is the one, uh, well, um, yeah. Uh, God has acted in history. I don't know that. I don't know that that's a good, a good example. But, but a general truth in the past can be, uh, a general truth can be stated by, by using the aorist tense. This is an interesting one, the epistolary aorist. Um, because when they wrote a letter, when they would be reading them, the letter would have been written in the past. So when, when Paul says, I have written to you briefly, um, uh, he's of course writing it in the present tense when he writes that. But when they, when they read it, it's in the past tense. I wrote you briefly concerning these things. Uh, because when they read it, he's in the past tense of writing it, even though when he was writing it, it was in the present tense. Isn't that interesting? So I think we would, we would do it the other way. Uh, I would say, uh, hi, mom, I'm writing you for money. I write you for money. But in, in, if you were doing it in the Greek world, you would say, I have written you for money, mother, uh, in hopes that you will give me some. Uh, so that's the epistolary aorist. There is the dramatic aorist. Uh, I think some question this one, but this is my son uh, in whom... I am well pleased is the way it usually puts, is, is the way it's usually translated, but it's, it's aorist, and the, the one in whom I have been pleased. Uh, but it, we, uh, it, that's a, maybe a dramatic or a final definitive way of stating it, but it's usually translated in the present tense, in whom I am uh, well pleased. The aorist can focus on the beginning. Uh, so let's say, so, so aorist is what we call punctiliar action. It's viewed as a blah, as a, as a, as a point. Uh, and so um, he sojourned with them, you know, 40, 400 years. Uh, I'm looking at that whole so sojourn as a point. But you can focus on the beginning of the point, the whole point, or the end of the point. And when you, when you focus on the beginning of, of the, say, he, um, and, and uh, Israel sojourned for 400 years, let's say you were telling the story. Um, it is allowed for you to translate that Israel began to sojourn. Uh, if you want, as, as of the beginning of that, of that point. Uh, so that would be called an ingressive aorist. Or you can focus on the end of the point. Um, now, I, I don't want to confuse you. With beginning students, I usually say, use the word has or have for the perfect tense so that you don't get it confused. But you can use have or has uh, in a way that is aoristic. In fact, the way that we use have and has in English tends to be aoristic. Greek is somewhat unique in using have or has for something that is completed but has continued. That's a very unique 
Greek thing to do. So when I say um, uh, he has he has finished his course, um, uh, if I'm let's say let's say that it's today that you finish the course, and you say you finished the course, uh, that's not perfective or completed. That's that's the end of of a journey, right? Uh, you fit. You have finished your course. That's an aorist, um, a consumative error or a resultative aorist uh, kind of use. And then, if you just look at blah, the whole thing, Jesus wept. That would be a consumative, maybe a consumative aorist, looking at the whole thing, or or uh, he he delayed forty years, looking at the whole thing. Um, uh, okay, uh, so those are some of the nuances of the aorist. By the way, if you're if you're a beginner, don't be thrown off by uh, this this slide. Uh, in fact, you're welcome to skip it, although it's too late now because you've listened this far.